Today on New England Living, we're heading to scenic Newport, Rhode Island to explore the best of what the city has to offer. From a collection of some of the rarest and most unique automobiles in history, to one of the area's top venues for local craft beer and spirits. Plus, we're visiting one of the region's most luxurious and secluded seaside destinations. It all starts right now on New England Living. New England is full of adventure. I can't believe you guys are letting me do this. Up, up, and away. Look at that. Oh, we just did your first takeoff. Join me as we discover the people and places that make us so unique. This is it. You can't find it anywhere else in North America. I mean, does it get any better than this? Love the place you call home with New England Living. Thanks for joining us today on New England Living. I'm your host, Rachel Holt. First up on today's show, we're in gorgeous Newport, Rhode Island for a tour of the Audrain Auto Museum with CEO Donald Osborne. This is an amazing space and it kind of has more of a feel of an art museum than a car museum. I don't know if you've heard that before. We have indeed heard that, Rachel, and it's something that makes us feel very, very proud of, of this building and this gallery. The Audrain Auto Museum is an extraordinary place because one of the things that we feature is the fact that we change our exhibitions four times a year. And so this gallery space takes on a completely different look and ambiance depending on what is in the gallery. The collection runs from 1899 to Contemporary Cars 2024. And that encompasses the museum's collection of about 50 cars, plus the collections of those of the board of directors of the museum, foundation, as well as great friends of ours. And from that 400 vehicles, plus motorcycles, we can choose to tell stories that put the automobile and the motorcycle, in some cases the bicycle, into context. Because all of these are objects that, that have touched us as a society and personally as people. We try to do something in every exhibition to have a moment of great comfort and warmth and surprise as soon as a visitor guest walks through the front door. In the exhibition we're in right now, JDM and Beyond, the worldwide influence of Japanese automobiles, the visitor guest walks through the door and sees a 1979 Honda Civic, a car that a lot of us knew when we were growing up. Say, wow, of course, I remember that. That was my first car. My grandmother had one of those, whatever it is. And right behind it, right across your eye view, is a 1988 McLaren Honda MP44 Formula One car, a car which was, up until last season, the winningest Formula One car in history in a season. And so you realize that the same manufacturer is developing and marketing these two products together, it starts to tell you some of the stories that we tell here in the museum. How are you helping preserve that rich history that we can find in Newport through these automobiles? The mission of the Audrain Automobile Museum is a very simple and clear one. It is to preserve, celebrate, and share automotive history. And to that end, we obviously display cars here in the gallery. We also drive all the cars. All the cars and motorcycles in the collection are drivable. So when you come to the gallery, you'll see a QR code with information about the cars. You can click on a QR code and in most cases, then see a video of the car being driven. So you get to actually experience this kinetic art, both here in the gallery and out in the road. And it must be really fun to see the reactions of people to see a car that they had growing up and that nostalgia factor, and then see a car that they've never seen before and then you get that wow factor. It is astonishing and amazing and I say quite firmly that there are people who self-identify as car enthusiasts, and then there are people who have not yet discovered what their connection with a car might be. And we try to offer that opportunity because not everyone comes with the same motivation to see an exhibition. We want to make sure that we can give satisfaction on some level to everyone who walks through the door. Depending on when you visit here, you will always find something different going on with this museum. You don't really sit still too much. We don't. There's no <laughs> sitting still here at the Audrain. Whether you come for one of our four regularly scheduled exhibitions throughout the year, which run for about three months each, or practically any weekend from April through November for our Cars and Coffee events, or for our flagship event, the Fall Audrain Newport Concours and Motor Week, a four-day extravaganza of everything which the Motor Week stands for, Newport, history, luxury, and sport. You won't be disappointed. It's one thing to see the cars like this. It's another thing, I'm sure, to be in a car and take it around. But we get to do that today, right? It's all about the experience, Rachel, and we're going to have exactly that in a wonderful, rare Porsche donated by a grateful member of the museum. 
Let's take a ride. You had me at Porsche. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> and so we headed out in the rain for a one-of-a-kind tour of the surrounding shoreline and mansions in a vintage 1965 Porsche 912, a ride fit for Newport royalty. Thank you. You're welcome. Look at this car that we get to take out. <laughs> wow. Thank you so much. Newport is not a bad place to be. Newport is a spectacular place. Oh, yeah. Living in Newport is like living in a time machine. It is a place that is so incredibly historic. First of all, obviously, there are very few cities in America that were founded in the 17th century, and this happens to be one of them, which is also amazing. And it's a city that lives its history. Newport is also a very special place because of the role that Newport and Rhode Island played in the development of the automobile. It's something that a lot of people don't know about. I didn't frankly know a lot about it before I came here either. The first overnight incarceration for a traffic infraction was in Newport for a speeding ticket in uh, 1902. But also around that time, Willie K. Vanderbilt was a very enthusiastic and influential early automobilist. The second circuit race held in America was held in the Equidnick Park horse race track, which is currently where the Newport Airport sits. And the awarding of the first Vanderbilt Cup was in that race in 1901. So the development of the car and Newport are really quite closely tied together. I mean, there's so much history here, but if you have to see it, this is the way to do it. I want to do it in this car. <laughs> what are we driving? It's a very early Porsche 912, so 1965. Porsche made basically one model, which became the 356 in the early 50s, coming from their first model in 1946. And they made that up until 1964, late 1964, early 1965, when they switched over to the 911, which is the Porsche that sort of everybody knows. And there are in the Audrain collections about 55 Porsches. 55. So Porsche is a very important uh, brand for the collections. It's a very smooth ride. I don't know if that's a credit more to you as a driver or just the car, but you are handling the stick shift very well, too. You I will always take out. credit uh, as a driver. <laughs> no, these are easy cars to drive. It's frankly one of the things that make Porsches such popular collector cars is the fact that they are easy to drive and entertaining to drive. It is also, again, one of those things that Newport is the kind of place, too, where Bellevue Avenue, the home of these great mansions, is a place where a new Porsche would have been quite at home in 1964. I'm sure. And it feels equally at home in 2024. And you can tell the people around here really have an appreciation for a car like this just by the looks we're getting or seeing similar cars out on the road. This, this is a relationship that really means a lot and something really to be nurtured. We try our, our hardest to make sure that uh, we stay a very, very strong and integral part of this community. Coming up after the break, we're visiting a luxurious Newport destination with spectacular oceanfront views. When New England Living returns after this. Welcome back to New England Living. I'm Rachel Holt. Up next, we're checking out Newport's famed Castle Hill Inn with executive chef Jennifer Backman. Not a bad backdrop we have here. Chef Jen, we are at Castle Hill Inn. It sits on 40 acres and it is gorgeous no matter where you look. What makes this property so special? Um, well, I think you're looking at it. Yeah. You know? I mean, it's probably one of the most beautiful spots in, in Rhode Island, certainly in Newport. You know, there's a ton of history with the inn itself. It's isolated away from the hustle and bustle of town. It's just spectacular. What is the history of Castle Hill Inn? Castle Hill actually used to be the summer home of Alexander Agassi. He was a marine biologist and he did a lot of his researches here. And actually the funny thing about that is the name of our fine dining restaurant actually comes from one of his research subjects and that's uh, the jellyfish, Aurelia. And that's kind of how that all ties into a bit of the history also. As far as the accommodations go, there's so many unique offerings here, whether you're on the hill, facing the beach or in the mansion, where can people stay? 
So in the mansion, we have seven rooms. One is the turret suite, one is the lighthouse suite. We also have two rooms at the top of the chalet. We have harbor houses and we also have some beach houses, which are really beautiful and they have private beaches as you're walking up the drive. Describe one of these beach houses for us because the view, it really will not get too much better than that. It really doesn't. You have your private beach like right out back. You have the fireplaces and the big soaking tubs. They're gorgeous. When you're here, you're really getting the best of both worlds. We're on 40 acres. There's 33 rooms here, which really gives you a sense of privacy when you're staying here. At the same time, we are so close to downtown Newport. What makes this place so special? I think probably because you can have the best of both worlds. You know, you can be secluded and really enjoy this property almost as your, your own little private getaway, but you can also easily access downtown. Uh, we have a boat launch that, that can take guests in and out of town, so you can have a night out if you want to do that as well. So with that, I took a short walk down to the pier and hopped aboard the Mistress, the inn's private boat launch for a quick trip around Castle Hill Cove. Not a bad day for a boat ride. Beautiful day for a boat ride. Nice Welcome to meet you. Aboard. Thank you so much. This shuttle starts from the inn and it goes to downtown Newport. How long does that take? It's probably about a 20 minute run. Okay, that's not bad. Not a bad way to travel, no. right? No, and it's, it's comfortable. You get to see a little bit of the uh, waterfront. What are some of the highlights that you'll see along the way? Uh, heading in toward Newport, we'll come up to the Kennedy compound area, and we'll also go by uh, Fort Adams. And you get to skip the traffic that way too, especially yes. in the summer, right? And no park, you don't have to worry about parking. Okay, this is the way to travel, I think. Yes. Go to Captain Tom. <laughs> <laughs> These are prime waters where the rum runners used to come in. Oh. These little coves back in the day, pretty neat. A lot of history here. We're right on the water here. We have boats going by. We can walk to this amazing lighthouse that's on the property. What is the maritime history of Newport? I think looking at the location, you know, it's the, it's the quintessential spot to, to really see all the races. You know, you can see the America's Cup right here from the lawn with the lighthouse being over 125 years old. I mean, it's just, we're rooted in history. Posting up in one of those lawn chairs, I could be happy doing that for hours, and I'm sure a lot of guests could, but what are some of those other activities that we can find here? You can definitely sit in one of the beautiful Adirondack chairs and watch the sailboats go by. There's numerous places that you can go and hide away and see some beautiful sights. You can go and see our new beehives. So we have a ton of stuff for guests to do. What I really like is you don't have to stay here to enjoy this property. You can come, you can check out the lighthouse, and of course you can come here for the dining. Absolutely. Which is a scene in itself. What makes the dining scene here so special? We really take into account like where we are and we focus on coastal New England cuisine, you know, so uh, we try to bring in ingredients from, you know, as nearby as we can and treat them with authenticity and freshness. This is fine dining at its finest, and the view that goes along with it, to go with the amazing food and the drinks that you're getting here, can't beat it. Describe the concept of Aurelia. Aurelia is our newly re-envisioned fine dining restaurant. So it is a six course tasting menu. I would describe it more of it as an experience as opposed to just a, just a tasting menu. You're not coming out for dinner, you're coming out for the whole experience, whether or not you do wine pairings with it or non-alcoholic pairings, or you add a cheese cart to it. It's just elaborate, it's beautiful. You have the fine dining experience, but you also have the lawn terrace, which is a little more casual, a little more coastal. Absolutely. I mean, I think it's a great opportunity for everybody to experience Castle Hill, you know, because it is a bit more approachable. You can get your classic fare, you can get your New England chowder, and you can get your lobster rolls. But we're still featuring those local ingredients. You know, we have some beautiful salads on the menu that are, that are going to evolve with the season. So, you know, as tomatoes come into season and as peaches come and, you know, they come and they go, we're going to evolve with that. And you, can, and you can really taste that on the menu. You're really focused on those local seasonal ingredients, so much so that just steps away from the restaurant. You're sometimes finding your food for the night at Castle Hill Garden. We are, we are. You know, we like to say it's, it's meters, not miles away. 
I'd love to show you the garden if you'd be interested. Let's go check it out. Awesome. A quick stroll down from the main mansion, we found ourselves at the inn's own private gardens. So now we're here in the garden. This is where you get a lot of those fresh ingredients and we're just steps away from the restaurant. So pretty convenient for a chef. It is, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. What are some of those seasonally driven things that you focus on when it comes to the garden? You know, that evolves with the season. Definitely lots of fresh herbs and flowers. We like to garnish with a lot of just fresh, bright ingredients to, to kind of give the dishes a little extra pop. And then as many vegetables as we can. How big of a help is it as an executive chef to have this as a resource just steps away from where you work? Oh, it's a dream. You know, it's a dream and it definitely, I mean, it gives all the chefs so much inspiration as to what we're going to do for that day. You know, if it's not on the menu or, you know, maybe we just have a small plot of it, we can run that as an addition for the day and really just feature what's happening right now. As far as what you're growing right now, what are we seeing in this garden? Because it's looking pretty good right now. It is, <laughs> it is. It's, it's definitely great. Um, so, I mean, we definitely have some fresh uh, herbs and, you know, some of the blossoms that I was telling you about that we like to garnish our, our dishes with. We have some alyssum and we have some mustard greens here, some pansies, um, parsley, of course. Castle Hill Inn has really become a foodie destination, whether you're staying here, whether you're visiting for the day. Ultimately, what kind of experience are you hoping that diners can take away? Ultimately, we just want it to be memorable. We hope that, that our food has a sense of place. And when you're here, that you're really experiencing like what that means and, and being in a coastal New England restaurant. And hopefully you're tasting the freshness of the ingredients you know, that are grown right here. Coming up after the break, we're checking out a popular local brewery and distillery, doing things a little differently when New England Living returns after this. Welcome back to New England Living. I'm Rachel Holt. Up next, we're stopping by Newport Craft for a look at their newly renovated venue with CEO Brendan O'Donnell. This is an expansion that took years to complete. Now that you have a facility of this size, you have the brewing side of things and then you have the distilling side of things. First of all, how does the brewing work? Well, I think as a company, we separate ourselves by being a brew distillery, which is kind of a term we coined ourselves when we were actually just in a company meeting trying to describe ourselves because there's a lot of companies that try to do both, but they'll add a vodka or a gin because you don't have to age it. What makes us really different is we have aged spirits, some that are 10, 12 years old, because in 2006, when we became the first distillery in Rhode Island in 135 years, the company was using the cash flow from the beer side to pay for the spirits aging. So our beer connects to the spirits because we have a Solera program where we can have aged beer in our spirits barrels. All of our beer brands are very different. The Newport Craft brand is really accessible for everyone. So we have styles like an amber ale or a blueberry where maybe they're not the sexiest craft beer styles, but they're approachable for anyone that wants to come up here. And then we have Radiant Pig, which is really our, our hop heads beer where it's all based around art and Basquiat. And then Braven, which is really a classic historic Pilsner style. So we hit all the different styles and there's really something for everyone that makes us, I think, different. And then the distilling side, what goes on there? We have a rum brand called Thomas Two, a whiskey brand called Sea Fog, and then a clear spirits brand called White Squall. With our rum, it's what our distillery was started with in 2006. So our rum actually is now pretty famous. It's in Disney World in Epcot. We got rated by USA Today as the ninth best rum distillery in the country. So there's been a lot of accolades for it because of how long we've been really doing it in one of the originals. Our sea fog whiskey, we've gotten very high regards, and that has been scored against some of the biggest whiskeys in the country. And then our white squall products with the vodka, the gin, and soon to be the, the blueberry vodka, all tie nicely because we have a real portfolio now. And we're adding some new things on a smaller scale. Sea flame, which is a version of our sea fog, but it's spicy with our own kind of pepper blend to be kind of like fireball. And then we're adding a coffee liqueur or coffee vodka right now. We're testing out because of the rise of espresso martinis. So we can make a quick change and, and make one local here and kind of listen to what our client wants. 
Sounds like you've been doing something right. <laughs> I, I hope so. Or we've been getting lucky. I don't know. <laughs> the thing that sticks out is the size of this facility. Give us a walking tour of what we can find. So where we are right now by the brew house is where everything starts. So the goal is to make it as simple as possible so the beer can start here and end by the loading dock. And it goes kind of in a straight line. So we make the beer in our brew house. It goes into our fermentation tanks, which are the big cone tanks to become alcohol and then it finishes in the bright tanks, which are the cylinder tanks. And that's from there is where we package it into our canning line or to kegs. Once it's done there, we can move it right over to the loading dock area where we now have a huge walk-in that can keep beer fresh and cold. And it can go right out to the seven states that we distribute in. On the other side of the packaging area, we have our distillery. So the distillery and the brewery don't interfere with each other. They, they're kind of self-sustained on their own. So they have different silos, they have different everything. And then the common denominator is that they both kind of meet in the middle with the packaging and then go out in the loading dock area. So it's really set up to be as efficient as possible and to be kind of minimalist in the way that we have to move things around and to not be invasive in the natural process of the production of all of our products. Something really unique about this place is there is a microbiology lab on site. How does that work? Craft beer and craft distilling is science. I mean, at the end of the day, what we're doing is everything's turning into alcohol, right? And there's a process for it. And we're trying to do everything we can on the beer side to keep oxygen out. A lot of breweries will send out their products to outside labs. By being able to do that in-house, we can not only control what is going on in our own facility, but we can actually tell people, we can get behind our product and say, we have tested this and we know what's in it. And it's really important for us from a quality control standpoint, because at the end of the day, everything we're making is consumed by people and we wanna have the best possible product that we can stand behind. What makes what you're doing here unique as a brew distillery? Well, besides trying to make world-class beer and spirits, it's our whole process. And a lot of what breweries do is waste. There's waste water, there's a lot of caustic acid and chemicals that go into the water system. And then there's spent grain. Over the course of a year, we get up to almost 700 or 800,000 pounds of that. And we've developed a spent grain silo where local farmers from all over the state can come and pick up grain for their animals to eat, which benefits the farmers locally, but also benefits the town so that we're not just putting it in the water system. And then we're continuing to work on dialing in our wastewater treatment facility. So we have a brand new uh, wastewater or treatment facility that we've added in here. So the goal is to be putting water out cleaner than it came in. We're trying to be really cognizant of who we are as a company and in our environment in our town around us. The thing that really sticks out when you're on site here is just the size of this facility. Give us an idea of what goes on in the different areas that people can come and enjoy themselves. The size has kind of grown organically, honestly. Newport gets about 4 million visitors every season. So for about seven months out of the year, it's really busy on site here. But we can do a farmer's market, we can do a film festival outside, but we don't have to shut down the facility upstairs. We wanna be open for the locals. We wanna always have options for people to kind of come on site and enjoy our product, but also do things that are very kind of like VIP, whether it's like a tour or a tasting in our distillery and still have options for everyone upstairs or outside as well. And this is also a facility where there's really nothing else like it. So it's a destination. And our goal as a destination is to be a draw for people to come into Newport so that the rest of the city can also benefit from it. So we're having an economic impact that's gonna benefit everybody. When people come here, what is your hope for the experience they'll have? I wanna wow them. I want people to be blown away by not just the view, but by the hospitality experience. We have our hospitality philosophy that we've developed. It's really to make this an experience that people remember. We want people to come in here and treat them like their family. We want people to learn something. We want people to experience our products and be blown away by not just the facility, but the quality of what we're doing and really the uniqueness of it. And then also just the knowledge from our staff that can recommend going to places locally or just really talk about anything in this industry because the thing that's really different about breweries and distilleries is that the people that work here really love what they do. And we want people to love what they do when they're here. So that radiates to customers when they come in. So they make connections and um, we build the experiences for them.
Thanks for joining us today on New England Living. For more on the show or anything you've seen here today, visit us at newenglandliving.tv and follow us on social media. I'm Rachel Holt. See you next time on New England Living.